Hi guys. So last week, Google put this paper on the archive. It's a paper claiming observation of time crystals. There's been a lot of newspaper headlines making this out to be a major breakthrough, huge sensational headlines like Google may have created an unruly new state of matter. This could be a great thing for quantum computing. Google's time crystal discovery is so big we can't fully comprehend it. Google's time crystal could be the greatest scientific achievement of our lifetimes, which is really some huge claims. So uh, what we're going to do today is to talk a little bit about, so what is a time crystal? To talk through a little bit of Google's recent results. The story of time crystal starts around about 10 years ago, back in 2012. It was introduced by Frank Wilczek. He's a Nobel Prize winner at MIT. And as you can see already from this first paper, it's actually closely related to spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the basic idea, it's spontaneous symmetry breaking of time. So to first understand this, we need to understand a little bit more about spontaneous symmetry breaking. So let's just recap that. The archetypal example of spontaneous symmetry breaking is the ferromagnet. So as you know, in a ferromagnet, basically you have little spins, which are the magnets of the atoms, and they all like to point in the same direction. And so we learn in undergraduate physics that we can describe this with an Ising model. And we have the minus sign here in the Hamiltonian because they want to point in the same direction. So the thing about a ferromagnet is that actually you can have two energy configurations, which are both the lowest energy states, right? So you can have all the spins pointing up because each spin wants to be facing the same direction, or you can have all the spins pointing down. And you can have some other configurations where you can have like domains of ferromagnetic regions, but these are high energy states. And so we're mainly concerned with the, like the low energy states of, of the system. So here's our first problem that actually the general ground state of the Hamiltonian that you might write is actually in general a superposition of those two states. So all spins up or all spins down. But we never really see such a state. So why don't we see this kind of state? The way that people understand this is a little bit different depending upon what community you are talking to. So in the condensed matter physics or particle physics community, people say that this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so basically the idea here is that the Hamiltonian has some particular symmetry, in this case saying that all the spin flips, so up spins, all up or all down are basically the same, but then the ground state doesn't obey that. It just goes, okay, I don't care about your symmetry, I'm just going to have all the spins pointing up. And so that symmetry is broken, so this is spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now you might ask like, okay, but like, how did it get into a particular configuration to start with? Well, the way that people understand that is by saying that, well, it just depends upon the past history of what's happened to the ferromagnet in the past. So this ferromagnetic thing that was in a rock from the beginning of time and then dinosaurs were there and then eventually you came along and found it, but you found it in this up configuration and it just depends upon what happened to it in the past. But if you talk to a quantum information person, then uh, they would have a pretty different answer. So they would say that well, uh, you can have a superposition of those two states, but you'll have decoherence and then it will just decohere into one of these states. So now let's talk about crystals, which is getting closer to what we are trying to talk about. So in a spatial crystal, we also have this kind of spontaneous symmetry effect. So the, all the atoms in the crystal, they have bonds holding them together. So they all want to be separated by some distance. But then like the crystal configuration at the top or the bottom, these are equally valid configurations. Say you find the crystal in the top position, why would it be in that one rather than the bottom one? Well, again, uh, you would explain this by spontaneous symmetry break. There's no real preference for this crystal to be in any position, but due to, again, some historical reasons of this crystal being in some, some position, it just happens to be in the top position rather than the bottom position. Okay, so that's 
spontaneous symmetry breaking in space. Okay, so what's a time crystal? Well, if you look at the crystal in terms of position, so this top graph, then you'll see that the atoms are in arran arranged in some periodic way. If you plot the atomic density within the crystal, it'll go up and down, right? So that's oscillations in position. So a time crystal would be some oscillations, not in position, but in time, right? Okay, uh, that sounds fine, but uh, that's just an oscillator. So what, what's so amazing about that? Instead of just being an oscillator, we need this extra ingredient to have spontaneous symmetry breaking. So basically, it should be something that's oscillating, but it shouldn't be oscillating because you are shaking it around. It should just be oscillating because that's the natural state that the system prefers to be in. So the oscillation should arise despite the fact that the Hamiltonian is completely independent of time. You write down your Hamiltonian, there's no time varying parameters, yet somehow the system likes to oscillate. Time symmetry is like spontaneously broken. Uh, another thing, it should also be a kind of a stable state. So it shouldn't be some kind of transient state where it just sort of decays away or something that happens at the beginning. It should be a stable state of the system because if we go back to the original case of the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a crystal, that was like a ground state of the system, right? So this means that in the time crystal case, it should also be a stable state that the system would be in and it should just basically keep on oscillating forever. So basically that's what a time crystal is as defined by Wilczek. But what people are talking about more these days are actually discrete time crystals. And this time we say that it's okay that we are gonna drive the system. We're gonna actively oscillate the system in some way. Okay, but then in that case, how do we have this idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking? So in this case, we have a slightly different idea of if we are driving the system at some frequency, say with period T, then if the system responds with a different frequency to the driving frequency, then the system is responding with a frequency that you didn't put in there, right? So if you didn't put that frequency in there, then it spontaneously come up with this different frequency of oscillation. So people talk of a discrete time crystal if this driving frequency is different to how the system actually responds. Specifically, the period is usually some integer multiple of the driving frequency. So if you're driving it originally at one hertz, then the expectation value would be at a frequency which is like lower than one hertz, so 0.5 hertz or maybe a third of a hertz or something like that. Okay, so I think that's the crash course in time crystals. So we can go back to what this Google paper is talking about. So I'll hand it over to Jun Hang now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to give more uh, detailed explanation of this paper. Okay. So, so the idea that the system will have a expected value that oscillates like twice the period of the system is because that they have a eigenstate order that they will flip, you know, from one uh, eigenstate to the other and then flip back. So, so then you have the twice the period of the oscillating system. So a typical example of this kind of system is like icing model. For example, this is on the left that you can find in the in this Google paper that a typical operations that uh, there are three operations in place. So one is the, the driving force, driving field, which oscillates. And the other one, the second one is the interaction and also, you have the rotation, so which will flip the the every qubit. So, in order to have this kind of time crystal, you need all these three steps. The, the way to observe such a time crystal is to measure the expected value of sigma z, which is the poly operator on the z-axis. If you drive the system at the frequency uh, after period of t. And you will see that the expectation value of sigma x and x y does not oscillate, it just simply decays, right? But, but the sigma z 
oscillates in the frequency of two at two t. So this one is uh, not Google's result. No, this is a theoretical result. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So for them on the right side, they do a Fourier transform of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, yeah. and you can see this distinct uh, peak of sigma z at zero point five, right? Which is means the the frequency of the response is uh, half of the frequency of the driving mm. for driving field. Yeah. So this is the very distinct uh, a characteristic of the discrete time crystal. And if we look at the Google paper, and so they didn't really show that, you know, it's like twice the period because maybe they think this is commonly accepted, so they don't show it more. But this is their result. So this kind of time discrete time crystal is realized in the case that we all have out of equi equilibrium uh, phase because if you have a thermal phase, for example, if this G is very small, this icing model will just go to a thermal phase where you simply have decay. You, you will not have this kind of, if you have, this, for example, this G equal to 0 0.97, which is close to one, you will have this uh, phase as auto equilibrium and it will oscillate among two eigenstates. So, and in, in this way, you, you, you can see that the expectation value here, it also it oscillates, you know, because there's the decay, right? So what's the reason of the decay? Because there are two reasons of decay. One is the external decoherence, and one is the internal thermalization. And the, the, the black line is to show that what would be like for uh, external decoherence. And so on the on the right on the left side where you have a thermal phase, you can see that this decays much faster than this black line. So in, in indication of this because of the internal thermalization. But on the right side, you can find that uh, this uh, the the decay of the envelope is exactly uh, because of the external decoherence. So so internally they don't have a uh, thermalization. So when you normalize it on the and you will see that this with you normalize with the envelope, you will see that the oscillates you know very very well. In the prior theoretical work, have shown the model is expect to have this kind of discrete time crystal phase in a range where G is bigger than G uh, GC, where GC equals approximately to uh, zero point eighty four. So this is the phase transition between these two phases. And the other one important thing is because you, you see that there are three steps, right? So one in rotation, one in action, and then you have a discord. So this two this two graphs is from the 2017 paper, and this will show that the importance of the interactions. For example, subgraph A, only the flip is on, I think. The rotation is on. And the second one you have discord disorder. And then on the right side you will turn on the interactions and you can see maybe not easily from this uh, uh, time graph but from the Fourier transform uh, the graph you can see that the, this 0 0.5 you know, frequency uh, is distinct only for when the interaction is on. In the interactions off there's I mean there's actually two peaks and they're both around 0.5 right? No not no. really no. no they are so at the 0 0.5, exactly 0 0.5, this oh there's no peak, right? Oh, okay. So the I mean the, on the on the right side, on the side, on the left side. Well, yes, but uh, I thought that even if it's like, clo like this. close to 0 0.5, it's still a time crystal. It's not a time uh, crystal if no. it's not exactly no twice. No, yes, it's, you have to be 0 0.5. Or maybe it's transient or something. Is this transient behavior? Or? Um, this great time crystal based on the IC model. Mm. Uh, you need, you must have the, just have one half of the oh. original frequency. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you cannot explain mm -hmm. because the theoretic model says. Uh, mm. Mm. Well, okay. So, and this graph show you the importance of the disorder and also another important of uh, of time crystal. Uh, is because that you have to show this kind of uh, subharmonic, uh, you know, response, no matter what your initial state is, 
like whatever whatever the cho choice of the in your state you must have this and you can see that um, so on the on the left side that this this order value for each qubit is randomly chosen right on the right side where you have a constant so here that the test on three uh, initial state one is the new state and the one is the polarized and the one is random and for if you choose the choose this this order value to be uh, randomly distributed among certain value and you will see that all these initial states doesn't affect how you know how you behave how this expected value evolve during time but on the right side where you have um, a constant uh, disorder value you will see that they behave totally different so and th these two are the most uh, this you know important uh, characteristic of the time crystal it's kind of robust against yes exactly. situation yes, yes and it should be robot yeah. against the uh, disorder uh, variation uh, well my main question is like so it looks like it actually does decay off Right. Yes, because so, uh, I mean, external decoration. Uh, sorry, de de decoherence. decoherence. Yes, decoherence. So, so that's apparently okay. Yeah, but 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 this one is like because they do did have like some pre uh, thermal. You know, you had have some uh, oscillations, but in the end, then they will go to thermal state. But the Google one, it, it, it seems that does not have that property, so it's somehow better. Ah, uh, I see. Is this why somehow but did, this I don't is think attracting they, a lot of attention? Yeah, but I didn't yeah. think they explain very well, you know, uh, why the their work is like somehow much better than or the, mm. and the other ones. But um, yes, yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of surprising everybody is going so crazy over it, considering. There's already two papers in 2017. Yes. That yeah. actually said they observed, right? What's the difference between the normal time dependent oscillator? You're not in the camera. <laughs> Just the normal oscillator in the ground state, for example, quantum oscillator, mm. which oscillates forever because you desire to get it to the spatial, to the time domain, actually, from, mm. from the spatial or from, from the normal domain. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in Wilczek's original paper, the kind of nearly time crystal example that he gave was just like a superfluid that was revolving in a ring because that well, has some kind of oscillation in a sense. And it's also a stable kind of ground state, right? So I think, I think it needs to, uh, you know, at least in the original definition, it should it should be kind of stable forever. So I guess most oscillators would just decay. And in that sense, uh, at least in Wilczek's kind of idea of a um, time crystal, doesn't really quite satisfy it. But on the other hand, these do decay, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. another thing is like, goes for this kind of uh, many body localization, they are robust against the uh, perturbations, right? Right. And, and a little bit external bath, I think the uh, robust, whether it's for coherence state, mm. maybe it's not. Uh-huh, I see. So yes. if there's some kind of disorder, yes. it would uh, start to oscillate at a different frequency. Yes, exactly, uh -huh. maybe. I hope you enjoy this video and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and we'll see you next time. See you later.